about myself. I have a master's degree in architecture, and for a while I was in the architect world. Uh, I did stuff like this. Uh, I worked with digital media, uh, 3D modeling and everything, and eventually that got a little old. I decided I wanted to do something else. Um, I've always been interested in video games. I actually did my master's thesis on game design and creating an architectural design method based on game design tools. So uh, I I had actually worked on some very small, and by very small I mean crashed almost immediately into projects in college, and from that experience I was able to cobble together a day job teaching people how to tighten up their graphics and uh, by, which gave me the time to by night work on the development. I actually ran that time. Well. So uh, still wanting to have a way to use my master's degree in what I do, I tried to think about well how can I use my architectural knowledge together with what I'm doing with game design. Um, you know, they're both design fields, and if you really think about it, they're both trying to create interactive spaces for users to occupy. Um, so some quotes like, level design is where the rubber hits the road by Jay Wilbur um, really come to mind, where level design is where some of the, uh, a lot of the game mechanics that you've created become filtered into a interactive space. Um, not that different from a uh, famous architect, Louis Sullivan, who said, form follows function. Uh, this was at the beginning of the modern era, and he was basically stay, uh, stating that a building's shape should follow what it's meant to do. Um, if we look at some uh, game designers, specifically uh, Valve, uh, in an interview I did with Dario Rassali in 2008, he said that experience is key to their level designs. They try to figure out what gameplay mechanic or experience they're trying to build in their level, and then they design to that. You know, they do a lot of iterative design, they bring in people as early as possible, and they'll have them walk through white blocks that aren't necessarily anything yet, but they'll continually refine the experience to the point where it's ready for final art. Again, not that different from another famous architect, uh, Le Corbusier, who said the house is a machine for living in. And this uh, photo is from his uh, Unique de Habitation. Um, it's an apartment complex, but it's built upon the idea that everything was, is uh, referencing some human scale. So, really, if you think about it, both of our fields are very humanist. They function on the idea that we are trying to create something for somebody to enjoy. Uh, to use that really forbidden three-letter word, uh, we're trying to create fun. Um, so, there's a lot of architectural theory that can apply to game design. Uh, a lot more than I had an hour to talk about. So, I'm going to start from something very simple, and that's the idea of survival. In a lot of games, you're trying to keep your avatar alive so you can keep playing. Um, as much as, say, for example, Duke Nukem wants to call it ego, you're really a lot of times functioning with a health bar of some sort. So, um, today, I want to talk about some theories derived from uh, architectural theorist Grant Hildebrand, who, that is his book, and all level designers should own it. It's called The Origins of Architectural Pleasure. Um, he argues that the idea of pleasing spaces come from our survival instincts. They come from how we use space to survive when um, there were saber-toothed tigers and nasty weather, since, well, there's still nasty weather, but when that was actually a threat to us, before there was, you know, nice buildings like this with air conditioning, and, you know, we could just come inside when we were living in caves. So, if we're looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, today we're going to be focusing on um, the 
level of safety, so security of the body. Um, we're not really doing anything with the deployment, but the idea that the architecture of your space is going to be that which allows you to keep your avatar alive. Which, if you play with that, you can create some very uh, interesting levels. So where architecture tries to use these things to create pleasurable spaces because they all feel safe, you know, a game where you're always safe isn't very fun. So we should try to create uh, dangerous spaces in addition to the safe spaces. So uh, I'm going to hearken to something I call the problem of the protagonist, which is the idea that a lot of games are based on the idea that you have a naturally weak protagonist, that they need some modification of some sort. Um, so here, if we look at Samus, she's relatively weak, and especially in the first Metroid, she couldn't shoot very far. She actually started with not maximum health. Um, and then when you get a bunch of stuff, you become an armored walking battle tank. Same goes for using space to augment our avatars. Um, one of the principles of this is studying the actual sizes of our game spaces. And I've split them into three different types. Narrow space, intimate space, and prospect space. Uh, narrow space is a small enclosed space where the occupant feels confined or unable to move. This creates a sense of vulnerability. Uh, it's the idea that if something comes at you, you're not going to necessarily be able to fight it off. There's a couple of extremes to this. There is the uh, narrow space where you're uh, fully able to move, but then there's also the type of narrative spa or narrow space where uh, the game mechanics actually stop allowing you to, uh, to fight and things like that, like crawling through vents in dead space, etc. Um, we're looking more at the former type, uh, because if you're still able to move, you're still, still able to fight enemies, and therefore enemies could pop out at you. Um, so we're looking at things like hallways in Resident Evil, 